Good afternoon, everyone. Can everyone hear me clearly? All right, cool. Um, I wanted to go wireless, but the computer decided to do something else, so I'll be moving back and forth. Uh, this is my first time at Kai and at HCML, so I'm super excited to engage. Today, I'll share some thoughts on the design and evaluation of uh, human-centered explainable systems. I will start with uh, motivating our approach, and then I'll share uh, our insights using a case study and conclude by reflecting. My name is Upal, uh, the person next to me on the slide is Mark Burdell, who is my amazing co-author and advisor. Let's get started. A few years ago, um, I had a chance to check out a group of self-driving cars, and next to the backup driver was this person, the operator. And the only job of the operator was to think out loud and sort of verbalize on behalf of the car, mm -hmm. based on my little pacifier tablet that I had in the back seat, to put me at ease and make me feel comfortable. <laughs> this moment highlighted an important thing for me. It highlighted the power of explainability in, in sort of establishing confidence in the car without having necessarily anything to do with the performance of the car, right? So it was about me being able to make sense of the car's actions and feel comfortable based on the operator's verbalization. But what if instead of the uh, operator, the self-driving car could think out loud? Well, this is an aspirational goal, far away from getting there. But what may a first stab at making machines think out loud look like? And this is the central idea. It's about generating and evaluating natural language explanations. And I'll share two main things about that. On the design side, I'll share an approach of generating this explanation. On the evaluation side, I'll share some of the challenges and how we address them using two user studies. I'll share the position that there is this interplay that goes on between the design and the evaluation side. And they're sort of like coupled with them. And how the upstream design decisions, algorithmically, have consequential impacts on the downstream user. So with the big picture in mind, let's look at the case study that sort of delves deeper into it. The, the citation is here, is Automated Rational Generation, which was uh, presented at the Intelligent User Interfaces this year. I invite you to read the paper. For the sake of time, I'm going to go at very high levels and share the high highlights of the study. So it's done in the context of this game called Frog. Here's a little frog, and it makes a sequence of decisions as it goes from point A to point B, and uh, sequential decision-making tasks are underexplored in XAI. Uh, and one way of thinking about this is like, think of this as like a super simplified version of a self-driving car, thinking out loud as it is going from one point A to point B. But the design problem here is how do you do XAI in Frogger, right? Essentially, how do you get this out of Frogger? Like, getting to think out loud in natural language. Well, why don't we look at how humans think? So we're inspired by work in philosophy of mind, namely that of Jerry Fodor's, who sort of had this language of thought hypothesis, where humans, when they're talking, they are actually engaging in some level of translation from a language of thought to that of communication. Sort of a new release, so to speak, to English. And these natural language rationales have this level of abstraction in the sense that the words that are generated, right, not from my mouth, have a level of abstraction from the actual neural firings going on in my head. So how can we set this problem up in a technical sense? So we do this using machine translation. So we treat explanation generation as a translation problem. So on the left, you'll see like some fake state information. So it's like, can I, can I translate from that language to this language, right? That's the larger paragraph. And here's the pipe. So we start off with human players playing the game of Frogger, thinking out loud. We have a clever way of capturing their think aloud data. And along with the state and the action and the explanation, we feed it to a sequence to sequence neural net that learns the associations between the states and the explanations. And here we make a design decision of generating two styles of rationales. The first style is called focus and the focus view is meant to be shorter and concise, and the complete view is meant to be more detailed and more elaborate. And you will see how the design decisions that we made in the training model acts up and shows up in the evaluation side, showing the couple of major things. Well, generation is one thing. Evaluation turns out is another beast altogether. Um, we couldn't do a lot of procedural evaluations on this because accuracy values in this case wouldn't matter. We don't have the super set of all human rationales in the entire world. So what we had to do was to do human subject experiments. And this gave us an opportunity to do two things. First of all, establish both our outputs are not garbage, right? 
Second of all, if they're not garbage, which ones do people prefer? So in both user studies, people saw videos of Frogger this time autonomously playing the game of Frogger and thinking out loud in three different styles. P, in this case, was the exemplary, the best human rationale. Q, in this case, was the um, candidate rationale, so either focus group or completely. And R was the random. And, and for each action, participants rated along four dimensions, and they justified their ratings in open-ended text responses. And these are the four dimensions, confidence, human likeness, adequate justification, understandability. I'm glossing over how and why we came about this. This is in the paper. But what you want to look at in this diagram is how at every single point, the red reaches the blue for each of those dimensions. Red is our candidate, blue is the random, and green here is the exemplary. And thankfully, both for focused view and complete view, the perceptions of our machine generated rationales far superseded that of random. So good news, it's not garbage, right? If there's some learning going on, we have some confidence that this may work. But now, you know, time to face off, right? Elimination time. So now between the two generated rationales, which ones do people prefer? I gave some, a, a simple sample based on the same explanation. On the complete view, you will see that there is a little bit of, uh, of long-term planning and detailing. But the question is, do users actually perceive it that way uh, versus our intuition of doing it? Turns out that when you pit them against each other, Explanations with more detail come out strong, even though they have some linguistic errors in them. Because our network didn't have a notion of grammar, per se. So the more you let it talk, the more it's going to screw up, right? Uh, and it's fascinating that like, even then, my bet was actually on complete view. I lost my own bet. Um, people preferred the, the complete view. So this sort of highlights right, that in this case, the AI didn't need complete view or focus view. That, that wasn't the requirement that the AI needed to do the job. It was playing frog as well. But humans did, right? So this is how an upstream algorithmic design decision, which actually was an arbitrary one, we could have done other kinds of styles of rationale, did end up seeing some downstream user effects. So I'll zoom out. So we've gone through the case study and share some questions that have come up through the case study. And I would, I would love to hear some thoughts and, and and potential collaboration on this. Um, our explanations right now are one shot. They're just given at a single time. They're always on. You always explain the action. And then it's only interacting with one human being. But what if, uh, what about temporal evolution, right? How we already talked about how explanations evolve over time as the decision goes on. How do we even design for this? How do we evaluate this? What if, now instead of a dyad, it's a team? How do you understand not only the relationship between the human and the computer, but also between the human and the human that is now interacting with the computer? So how does collaborative AI look? Wherever you are in the spectrum of machine learning or AI, I think these are right human factor questions to tackle and, and to look into. I'll zoom out finally and share some reflections. First. Uh, as, as I've been sharing, there is this interplay between these two sides, which often is counterintuitive because you know you sort of design something, then you evaluate it, but if you put the evaluation ahead and then you consider it, then there is this little interplay that you see between the two sides. And for a coupled system like ours, you really get to test out how much control you have on one side first. How much of the input really gets out the output that you really want. And that, in our case, at least gave us a first step formative understanding of this space, clearly we have a long way to go. Second, when it comes to evaluation, it is challenging. But at the same time, it opens up a really interesting possibility of designing well-grounded experiments that can help us unpack these hyper-contextual situations. Speaking of context, explanations are never one size fits all. So the use case actually often defines how you want to go about evaluating it. For instance, in the self-driving car example, Engineers may have a different requirement in the types of rationales they want out of a self-driving car for diagnosis purposes. Then if the passengers like me, we're just trying to feel comfortable that you're not going to crash into something. So evaluation of those things are also contextual. Finally, um, I feel like this case study for us has really helped us refine our own approach 
It has shown us things that we did wrong the first time. It has shown us things that we luckily got right the first time. And it has really ex helped us push the frontier of this kind of rational generation system. Finally, um, this kind of work doesn't get done alone. We got my amazing lab mates, mentors, the 10,000 pilot testers who are patient with me, and the funding agencies. Uh, thank you so much for your time. For this we do, for this purpose we do, but I want to highlight some, so this will be on my back. Um, in this case, this is the step where the user basically evaluate and sort of review their own rationales as they have gone over time. So let's say as you're doing your own gameplay. And we saw a lot of self-editing that goes on in this state. And if you're thinking aloud, it's hard to know what's coming ahead. But when you give people a chance to review, what was surprising for us is we saw people go back and as you step through the game, they end up reviewing different aspects of it. So for this purposes, yes, we are treating them all as equal, but that insight that we saw in the data collection process actually gave us this understanding that that's probably not like a complete way of looking at it. And that would be a very interesting question to explore, of like how do we privilege this, and how do we even get at um, uh, sort of this notion of later explanations versus higher explanations. Thank you for the question. Yes. I think you're opening a very interesting issue, which is when you look at how autonomous cars work today, they rely more on LiDAR information than on visual It's the opposite, <laughs> okay? They think about distance. Uh, it's more like they are bats in some ways. And it is where I think Frogger is similar, right? So. So you're not explaining how they understand. It's a, you're trying to explain how we think they understood. I think it's a beautiful point. Thank you for bringing this up. Because if you think about it, this is where I'm going to go a little bit of the Madonna my philosopher hat and sort of respond to that point, right? Neural nets, the way they do is fundamentally alien, right? When you interpret how a neural net works, by definition, you're slapping a layer of interpretation on it. In this case, it's a human interpretation. In our case, the choice was to use language to explain it. So the other way I often thought of during that day, I was like, what if like, I could do this entire data collection study with that operator guy, right? At different points of the car. I would just, because it really didn't matter, to be honest with you, like how the lighter was working for me as a passenger in that moment to feel comfortable with the car. What it did help was when I got to understand an expert thinking out loud in a way that was more accessible to me, and it helped me establish confidence in the vehicle. So you're absolutely right. It is almost putting a black box on top of a black box to get some explainability. But then, what is language, right? If you think about the whole purpose of language, it is, in one sense, a black box that we describe the meaning to. And then, we are slapping that on top of another black box, which is often our mind, because our thoughts are not always consciously accessible. But computationally, there is meaning that evolves out of that interaction. So thank you for bringing that up. I didn't have a chance to address it in the short presentation, but thank you. 